Leave anything for us? For us? For us? A good supply of body bags. Body bags. Body bags. Welcome to the Movie Morgue, where we fill out toe tags for cinema's body bags. I'm Josh, your movie examiner, and today we're dissecting Terminator Genesis, released in 2016 and directed by Alan Taylor. After Terminator Salvation's poor performance and reception, the franchise was again in legal turmoil. We are dead! We are all dead! The owners of the franchise, Halcyon Company, filed for Chapter 11, and in order to avoid bankruptcy, had to sell the rights to Terminator and eventually they would land at Paramount under Skydance Productions. The upside is Schwarzenegger would be returning after his terms as governor of California. I'm back. <laughs> I'll be back. That was one of those moments where it was just like, shit, yep, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there they are. But they had to write the script around the fact that he was now 67 years old. Ryan Johnson, Denny Villeneuve, and Ang Lee were all asked to direct, but only after original choice, Justin Lin became involved with the Fast and the Furious franchise. Alan Taylor ended up in the director's chair. Oh, he's just so good. He's just so good. And action. Primarily known for his TV work on HBO shows like Sopranos, Sex and the City, and Game of Thrones. He directed the infamous Beyond the Wall episode and many more. And everyone's favorite Marvel movie, Thor The Dark World. Taylor loved the first two films and believed he was the best choice for director, stating he could fix the film and make it work, whatever that means. He will get the point across very clear that we can do better than that. The story was originally going to go the Marvel route and expand into the multiverse, and largely ignore the previous two films. They ultimately cut the multiverse idea, but stuck with their trusty time travel. Genesis is a rough entry in the Terminator series. It feels more like a family melodrama than a Terminator movie. What, uh, why, why, why wouldn't you say something? Kyle and Sarah have more of a sibling rivalry than a romantic connection. I think you hurt his feelings. This doesn't have feelings. And Arnold's return to his iconic role feels like a mission for a paycheck. Nice to see you. That's not to say he's bad here, though. He quite possibly gives the best performance in the film. Theoretically. While the rest of the cast seems like they're in completely different movies. Who the hell's a skin job? What the hell is going on? In this restart, John Connor sends Kyle Reese to 1984. What you're doing right now, this is the end of the war. Amidst the war with the machines, to protect Sarah Connor from the T-800 tasked to assassinate her. Why should I send you? Because I'd die for Sarah Connor. Kyle arrives to find that the 1984 he was sent back to has been drastically altered. Listen to me, Reese, everything's changed. The 1984 John sent you to, it no longer exists. For starters, there's already a geriatric T-800 there. Hello, calories. He's been protecting Sarah from a T-1000 since she was a child, and they were expecting Kyle's arrival. <laughs> Planning to use a makeshift time machine to go to the year 1997 to stop Judgment Day. If the past can change, then so can the future. But Kyle is having impossible new memories that guide them to the year 2017, where the launch of a new iOS named Genesis is really just Skynet in disguise. Kyle discovers his frat brother, John, is not only his son, You're my son, you. But has gotten some cybernetic upgrades. I'm not machine, not man. I'm more. And was sent back to ensure the launch of Genesis and the birth of Skynet. I won't let them hurt you. Sarah, Kyle, and Pops race against time to prevent the new iOS from launching while their bastard son morphs from family. John is not humanity's last hope anymore. To foe. He's Skynet. John, please! I absolutely will not stop ever until Skynet rules this world. Rule this. But how many bodies do you think we'll bag in Terminator Genesis? Drop your guess in the comments below. But for now, let's start the body count. We open with narration over scenes from a Terrence Malick movie. Before they died, my parents told me stories of how the world once was, what it was like long before I was born. But that was all before Skynet declared nuclear war on all humans. By the time I was born, all this was gone. We're treated to a bunch of CGI destruction as we smash into a title reveal that gets snapped away with the other half of the Marvel Universe. Well, We're given post-war imagery and Kyle tells us the survivors called it Judgment Day. Like we didn't know that. We watch murder skeletons scan survivors into camps and a young Kyle is scouring the ruins like a rat hiding from HKs. 
He then enters Michael Myers' hideout from Halloween Ends and finds a good boy that Michael was saving for dinner. <laughs> hey, Michael and Corey, could you keep it down? You're gonna attract a Terminator. Which they do, but before it strikes, the big JC descends from the heavens to save Kyle. His name is John Connor. Son of Sarah. He's played by Australian actor Jason Clark this time around, and you've seen him in the Pet Cemetery remake, White House Down, and recently in Oppenheimer. Kyle tells us a bunch of shit we've heard before. John's a badass, some call him a prophet, how does he know all this, yada yada yada, while we watch the Resistance battle the machines. This time Kyle is played by Jai Courtney, another actor from the land down under, seen in Suicide Squad and A Good Day to Die Hard. That's Kyle. Just he was simply the best actor for the job. But in my opinion, quite possibly the worst casting ever. We'll get back to that later. As they prepare to strike Skynet, John tells Kyle that the war will end tonight, and the boys bro out talking about what they'll do when the war's over, like building houses and drinking brewskis. Cold beer be good. I figure whatever happens, it's gonna be better than this. Which is my mindset going into Terminator Dark Fate. Kyle stares at a picture of his crush while John gives a TED talk, and for the first time we see the events that led to the opening of the original film. The OG T-800 is activated and making its way to the time displacement machine while soldiers ambush the camp, which gives us our first bunch of toe tags. I am authorized to use physical force. This ED-209 looking spider HK falls from the sky and mows down 15 resistance fighters all in one pass. This gunner here is a goner when the truck rolls over and a handful of soldiers are wiped out by HKs here. A total of 26 by my count, and the fall of Skynet. Skynet Central Core is down. Repeat, Skynet has been destroyed. But it's too late, because the Terminator's already taken the DeLorean back to 1984 to terminate Sarah. The movie was shot primarily in New Orleans, and the majority of the Future War sequence was shot practically, with actual sets, pyro, and extras. We got to actually spend time, you know, with some gritty, you know, full-on, full production of what it would be like to be in that kind of battle. There was so much pyro and atmosphere uh, and extras and uh, yeah, endoskeletons. At the observatory, we see a dramatic reenactment of the Terminator's arrival to 1984. What the hell? Skydance didn't have the rights to use any of the original 1984 footage, so everything had to be reshot with a digital Arnold graft over a body double. And they recreate these shots here pretty flawlessly. We go back to the future and John asks for a volunteer to go back to May 12th, 1984. And you'll never guess who raises his little hand. I'll go back. Kyle asked John how he knew all of this was gonna happen. And fair warning, don't sit in front of John in history class. I cheat. He says Sarah told him everything he knows up to this point, but everything from this moment forward, he has no knowledge of. Kyle asks what he should say to Sarah so she doesn't think he's crazy. And John says, hey, recite this little poem here. Thank you, Sarah, for your courage during the dark years. I can't help you with what you must soon face, except to say the future is not set. You must survive, or I will never exist. Kyle begins to depart when John gets a checkup from Dr. Who? You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? Yeah! Then takes a TARDIS ride to 1984. While in limbo, he sees memories from a life he never lived, namely his 13th birthday, where he gets a sweet new iPad with a countdown for iOS Genesis. He also sees a vision of Sarah and talks to himself in the mirror. Remember, Genesis is Skynet. You can kill Skynet before it's born. In a familiar alleyway, our reenactment continues as an unhoused gentleman sees a real, real bright light and the arrival of our time traveler. He makes Kyle's acquaintance, and hopefully this time he won't steal the guy's Nope, he's still in the guy's pants again. Back at the observatory, a Green Day tribute band thinks the Terminators had one too many. Yeah, I think this guy's a couple cans short of a six pack. <laughs> God, I miss Bill Paxton. But before he terminates the American idiots, a figure uses the Jedi mind trick on him. You won't be needing any clothes. But it's not Anakin Skywalker, it's a senior citizen T-800. I've been waiting for you. Johnny Kane. Kano. Round one, fight. Man, this 3D Mortal Kombat match is kick ass. Okay, it's, it's a movie, it's not a video game. Okay. Looked like a video game to me. Johnny Cage gives Kano his signature red eye while Sonya Blade locks and loads from afar. It's looking bad for Cage, but before Kano can finish him, 
Sonya squeezes the trigger and puts Kano down for a nap. And Johnny Cage wins, and he gives a thumbs up to his fans. Back in the alley, Kyle is looking derelict chic. He runs from a cop, steals his gun, and asks for the date, you know. What day is it? The normal stuff. But the cop adds his arrival time. The day you arrive. Oh shit, this guy's a fucking T-1000. That's right, shit's all fucked up in this timeline. But Kyle still needs to go shopping for a coat and some shoes. And he still doesn't get new pants. Everybody pants now, pants. Pants, 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 pants. She's he laces up his Nikes, but before he can get a snapshot of the moment, the T-1000 takes a stab at him. Which reminded me of a similar case in Day of the Dead. <laughs> Kyle runs right into the arms of officers Garber and O'Brien. They arrest Kyle, and now he thinks he's seeing that thing everywhere. The T-1000 comes out of the mirror dimension like the Prince of Darkness and lays waste to Officer Garber. Garber! <laughs> O'Brien shoots the rent cop in the face and then can't believe his eye. <laughs> they take cover and have some atrocious dialogue. It's a machine that kills humans. Uncuff me. No, you're under arrest. He comes after them like the Iron Chef when an armored car plows through the storefront to pick up a deposit, and Sarah Connor steals Kyle's pickup line. Come with me if you want to live. Hey, that was my line. Now, soldier. Okay, God. Hey, nice tracking device there. Sarah asks Kyle if he knows what his name is. Kyle Reese? Uh, the Terminator, I, I, I don't know. You hit your head back there? This time Sarah is played by the mother of dragons herself, Amelia Clark, before she was Han's pre-Leia love interest in Solo, A Star Wars Story. And she's not the only Game of Thrones alumni to portray the mother of the future. Before she was the evil queen of the Seven Kingdoms, Lena Headey played Sarah Connor in the short-lived Sarah Connor Chronicles TV show that ran for two seasons between 2008 and 2009. Sarah drops a bunch of exposition here, mimicking the original movie, but this time it's not nearly as riveting. I don't understand. You can't know any of this. But I do. And I hope you're prepared for some grade A dialogue here. Crikey, but I was like supposed to save you and stuff. And she's like, nah, we already got it handled. Oh yeah, meet Pops. Cut. Kyle jumps out and tries to impress Sarah, but Pops says it's nappy time. Oh great, that's just great. He loads Kyle up and tells Sarah to stop arguing with her brother. Fight me. That is a very immature response. Pops tells her about the birds and the bees and it grosses Sarah out. Ew, I'm supposed to fall in love with this dude? Kyle dreams about talking to himself in the mirror and gives himself a clue. Go to San Francisco 2017. But unlike the Ramones that's blasting on the radio, he doesn't want to be sedated anymore and wakes up to demand answers. Who the hell's a skin job? What the hell is going on? Jai, you're in a Terminator movie, not Blade Runner. I've got four skin jobs walking the streets. You need to get your robots right there, soldier. Here, let's get you properly introduced. This is Pops. You named it? It is nice to meet you. Are you kidding me? He's like, that damn thing's old, and it offends the senior cyborg. Old, not obsolete. Turns out the cyborg was sent to be Danny's Jorah Mormont. I mean, Sarah's protector when she was nine. The girl that you came back for, she's gone. But the files of who sent him have been erased. Oh, that's convenient. I know, right? And don't hold your breath waiting for an answer, because this is a plot point the movie will completely abandon. Sarah says if the past can change, why can't the future? We can stop Judgment Day from happening. Well, good luck with that, Sarah, because we've had two movies to try and everybody's failed. The T-1000 reacquires them and more gunplay ensues in a highlight of the movie. I love how the T-1000 turns itself inside out going through the windshield onto the hood of the car. It's one of my favorite shots in the film. For the short period of time he's present, actor Byung Hung Lee kills it as the liquid metal Terminator. His facial expressions and body movements are just as effective as Robert Patrick's were in T2. He was like, performed just like a machine. Uh, is, he, is he really a machine? Or what, what's going on here? Because he was so good and so precise, he would do- You probably recognize him from G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra and Retaliation, where he played Storm Shadow. But I highly recommend you check out his Korean film, I Saw the Devil, alongside old boys, Choi Ming Sik. It's a brutal movie with a great premise and excellent performances from both actors. Trust me, the less you know, the better, but you need to check this movie out. He finally hooks up with his targets, but they send him back to the hood of his car like Bobby in Robocop. Can you fly, Bobby? Then Kyle tries to impress Sarah. Watch this, Sheila. 
Fucking A, brah. Well, aren't you awesome? Uh-oh, looks like you got a leak there. Pops pulls the car over to ready a trap for the T-1000, while Kyle asks how this timeline got all fucked up. Does that matter? How, Sarah? She tells him a T-1000 came for her when she was a kid, and he tells her about the Game of Thrones season five cliffhanger. When John sent me back, he was attacked. For the watch. <clears throat> Did it kill him? Is John dead? I don't know. Pops gives them some time to speculate. If approximately 35 seconds. Or less. Guess you'll have to wait till season six to find out. It tosses a liquid metal javelin into Pops and then flicks a booger on the spare T-800. That reactivates it so he can keep Kyle occupied. They play hot potato and it melts the skin right off the cyborg. So he kicks Kyle through a trap door for a game of hide and seek. Ready or not, here I come. You can't hide. Gonna find you. He knocks Kyle's ass through a wall and then Kyle gives him a Kool-Aid man bursts through the wall. Oh yeah. And Kyle says, oh no, and decapitates the murder skeleton before it can tag him. I don't volunteer for this shit. My thoughts exactly when I decided to examine this movie. Sarah makes her way to a tunnel junction they booby trapped with barrels of acid hanging above. A pair of Kyles show up and do their version of the Spider-Man meme. Shit. Just told you that, listen, listen, I'm from the future. How dare you point at me? You, you were pointing first. Rude to point. You're being very rude. She rolls the dice and shoots one in the foot. We have a winner. She makes it rain acid on the Mercury Man and he starts to disintegrate with every step he takes. I'm melting! Melting! takes one last stab at Sarah, but Pop shows up in time to finish him off. You are terminated. The headless T-800 chills in a hot tub while Kyle and Sarah bicker some more. They enter a room where she and Pops have been building a time machine, but it doesn't require plutonium, just a Terminator CPU. They'd been planning to teleport to the year 1997, but Pops will have to take the long way to give his living tissue some time to grow back. But Kyle says they should be going back to 2017 due to the new memories he's been developing. How can he be remembering two timelines? It is possible if he were exposed to a nexus point in the time flow when you were in a quantum field. Meaning when John was attacked, it created a new timeline. Theoretically. All right, am I watching Terminator or Endgame? No, we go to 1997. It takes some convincing on Kyle's part, but Sarah finally changes her mind when he takes her hand and whispers a sweet nothing in her ear. Straight line. You just go and you don't look back. That was beautiful. Fucking A ride, I know. As they prepare to depart, Sarah asks Kyle what John was like. And he tells her about all the good times they had in the future. We burn our eyebrows right off. <laughs> oh man, we laughed for days. Man, they were something, weren't they? The way Courtney portrays Kyle is like a frat boy idolizing a frat brother while also wanting to fuck his mom. Did you mate? Oh, can you just not say the word mate to me again? Like. Ever. In the first movie, Kyle is riddled with PTSD and nearly out of hope, and I get no sense of loss or fearfulness from the performance here. And in a movie that's trying so hard to rehash the original, yeah. they don't even come close. You blow it the hell up. Sarah gives Pops a meaningless gesture, and the boys have a dick measuring contest. I've seen little to indicate that you're fit guardian for Sarah Connor. You know you're not her dad, right? Oh, you both just really need to stop this. They strip down to their birthday suits and depart for 2017, leaving poor old Pops behind in an empty nest. They grow up so fast, don't they? They materialize in the middle of a San Francisco freeway and somehow survive this. <laughs> We then see the senior citizen cyborg stuck in traffic and he watches as they're taken into custody. Hey, asshole. Get out the road. Fight me. That's an immature response, Pops. You said so yourself. On the way to the hospital, Kyle tells Sarah, told you so when Pops doesn't show and asks how a nine-year-old ends up with her own Terminator. She tells him about a vacation at their cabin in Big Bear, a nice little reference to the first movie, where a liquid metal Terminator killed her mom and dad. And even though we don't see it, I'll give Sarah's mom and dad toe tags. They seem integral enough to the story. And the last thing her father said to her was, You go, and you don't look back. How did Kyle know those words? He says it's an impossible memory he has of a beautiful Sarah Connor telling him this as a kid. We flash back to Sarah hiding under a dock, looking like she should be in the Friday the 13th remake. Pops walks over her just like the murder goalie does in that movie before he kills Willa Ford. 
She tells Kyle that Pops is the only person that's always been there for her. But Kyle reminds her that he's a machine designed to gain her trust, and she's not having any of that. I think I'm doing just fine. Thanks. Lieutenant Matthias and Detective Chung arrive at the hospital along with O'Brien. You remember? He was the cop in the department store earlier in the movie. Shit. He's now played by Oscar winner J.K. Simmons. The main reason I decided to do this movie was because my 12-year-old daughter is in love with Jai Courtney. And I said, OK, I'll go work with him. He's showing him pictures of Spider-Man, but he's the laughing stock of the force with his drunken stories about time-traveling robots. For now, all drunks with robot fixations ride the bench. You dick! They get some medical attention from Canadian actor Douglas Smith, who was in HBO's Big Love along with Terminator alumni Bill Paxton, and is also in Brandon Cronenberg's Antiviral, one of my faves. He chats with them about this sick new iOS update that's dropping tomorrow. Everything in my life uploaded and online 24-7. And if I have to give this movie some points, it nails the development of technology. The future is now. The police question them because there are no records of a Sarah Connor in this time. So that's impossible. But somehow you've gone so far off the grid that you don't even exist. But Kyle Reese sure does. Kyle Reese was born in 2004. He's 12. O'Brien is like, see, I told you they were time travelers. This dude looks exactly like he did in 1984. The subplot with O'Brien is so forced. The only reason he's here is to be an ally for our trio in this timeline. J.K. Simmons hams it up and has a good time with the role, but is very underutilized in a movie that could have used more from an actor of his stature. Sarah tells Kyle it's time to nut up or Shut up. causing a distraction so Kyle can pick his handcuffs, while Matthias takes O'Brien out for a talking to. Kyle and Sarah do some terrible flirting, and then Kyle hears the voice of a ghost. Speak the suspects alone. Yes, sir. John. <gasps> John's alive! No, 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 not John Snow, John Connor. Oh shit, it's my bro from the future, yo! Sarah's in shock, and I know, I would rather it be John Snow too. Game of Thrones is just so much more entertaining than this movie! Sarah's like, hold up, we know these things can imitate people, so you need to prove yourself. John's like, you right, you right. So, uh, yeah, Kyle, I gave you a picture of Sarah when we were alone. Crikey, fucking A, bro, yeah, you did. And mom, you sang Rocket Man to me when I was a baby. You're a sucker for Elton John. John. They avoid Homeland Security as they make their way to the parking deck, and Sarah sees that technology has already taken over humanity. This is the world now. We can't live without it. Crikey, you can't believe you're here, John. Maybe we should go get a pint, mate. Sounds good, Dad. Dad? Oh, this shit just turned into an episode of the Maury Povich show. You are the father. What? Cronky, what the fuck? My bro is my son? He can't be my son. We haven't even slept together. Then Sarah notices Pops. He snuck in earlier, hiding behind his big old teddy bear and knocked out the security. Goddamn time traveling robots covering up their goddamn tracks. I knew it. Oh, shit. Did this T-800 really play the long game just to whack John Connor? Why John? did you do that? And Judd Courtney's delivery of this line is impeccable. I can't say it with a straight face. Because he's a killer! Uh, it's like if Axe Body Spray were an actor, I swear. Pops puts Kyle in a chokehold because he's a huge fan of sleep token. But Sarah orders him to let go. You know, I think somebody buried John Connor in the pet cemetery because Lewis Creed here just came back to life. That hurt. He's not the man they think he is at all. No, 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 no. I'm more. He's a rocket man. Coming from the future to kill us all. We see dead bodies everywhere as we flash back to 2029. I had to go back to an earlier scene to get an accurate count for these bodies, so you've got John and Kyle with these four, and then you've got five through 14 here in this shot, and then we see 15 through 21 up on top of the platform. One of them is the infiltrator, and I'll just say it's this guy. The infiltrator has infected John with the Venom symbiote and reveals that they have only defeated slaves but he's no slave, he's Matt Smith, a fellow doctor. Hello, I'm the doctor. A recent addition to the Game of Thrones saga in House of the Dragon as Prince Daemon Targaryen, distant uncle to Danny. I'm not gonna lie, I'd love to say like, we asked him and he was like, sure, I'm gonna do it. No, we hunted him down to make him be in this movie. Smith is an amazing actor, but can't get a decent script to save his life. He is great in Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho though. 
Turns out this motherfucker is the Skynet. And John is so good at his job, the AI is like, I can't terminate you, so screw it. Here's a promotion. And with that, I'm saying John Connor the human is getting a toe tag. And the new and improved John Connor 2.0 was sent back to protect Skynet's creation. He offers Kyle and Sarah a chance to join him with the machines so they can be one big happy family. We're marooned, the three of us. We're exiles in time. You see, I can kill you, for there truly is no fate. Are you with me? And they refuse. John asks Pops, you feeling okay, old timer? John puts up a fight, but Pops takes him to the hospital for a checkup. He says, no, I'm good, but I think you need some fresh air and get some an oxygen tank. Okay, now lay down and have a Pepsi Max, and we'll get you in for an MRI in a minute. But he's gonna need to reschedule his appointment because the MRI machine is fucked. And Sarah can't leave her senior citizen at the hospital. So she goes in to rescue Pops, and the machines have been disabled due to the magnetic pull of the MRI machine. Crack it! I do very much like the image of John walking towards Kyle with his nanotech phasing in and out of the magnetic field. He tells Kyle, I thought you'd be smarter than this. He cranks the machine to 11 and dips out while John does a spin cycle. Cause baby, now we got bad blood! Hey! Pops explains that Skynet tested human subjects in developing a new Terminator, but all the subjects went insane and died. <laughs> Sounds like OCP's failed experiments in Robocop 2. But John was unique and his body was replaced on a cellular level, meaning there is no Dana. And John isn't humanity's last hope anymore. He's Skynet's. Speak of the devil, John has a chat with Miles Dyson and his son Danny. I remember you guys. Last time we saw Danny, he was a little guy. They've made a good investment in John and his ideas, and they funded the R&D for the Genesis program and his robotics work. Not only have they been busy with their AI development, they've also been building a DeLorean of their own. And Danny Dyson introduces Genesis to its over 1 billion users. I cannot wait to meet you all tomorrow. While John and Skynet have a quiet moment together holding hands. We will change the future together. Pops has a camp set up near the Golden Gate Bridge with everything they're gonna need. Including pants, calories. Can he make jokes? <laughs> I don't know if it was a joke, but I thought it was hilarious. And Pops has procured quite the collection of weapons and tactical gear over the last 30 years. The boys race to pack up their clips and Pops arthritis kicks in. Old, but not obsolete, not yet. Pops tells them that John is held together by a magnetic field, and if they get a big enough magnet, they could disrupt his phasing enough to hurt him. Great, all he needs a magnet the size of a truck. You got one of them lying around? I think you should talk to Jesse Pinkman. He might be able to help you with that. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Oh! That gives Pops an idea, and he fashions himself a pair of magnetic mittens. And you already know what Kyle and Sarah do with their alone time. We can't. Nope, they argue. That's all these two do is argue. If you love me, you die, and I. But John interrupts them and gives them one more chance to join forces and rule the world together. I absolutely will not stop ever until Skynet rules this world. And Danny says, I mean, Sarah, Sarah says, Josh, this isn't Game of Thrones. Tricaris. Okay, that's the last one, I promise. They pack up for a field trip across the Golden Gate Bridge while John walks out of the dragon's lair. And even though the majority of this movie is computer generated, I think the visuals are stunning, especially John's T-3000. John 2.0 hops aboard the bus and pulls the rug out from under Pops, and he gets picked up by a police cruiser. He then takes out the bus's brakes and causes quite a bit of destruction on the Golden Gate, but nothing I would say is deserving of a toe tag. He then rips the steering column off of the bus and it flips. And then keeps rolling, 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 rolling. Uh. Be loving this shit, right? And there are no toe tags on screen because these assholes survived this. Make sure you wear your seatbelts, kids. And they end up in a very lost world scenario, with John getting a smackdown from Kyle using Pop's magnetic mittens. Move your ass, soldier, that's an order. Hey, can you grab that backpack on the way out? Thanks, buddy. Give you a lift. Pop says they only have a 40% chance of success against the police, so they opt for handcuffs. Get down! That's my line. Get down. Get down! Bad boys, bad boys. 
They're booked and interrogated, while a young Kyle doesn't recognize himself in the two-way mirror. But he does look like you, Dad. Homeland checks up on Pops, and he looks like he just smelled Tammy Swanson walk in the door. She's here, isn't she? I can smell the sulfur coming off her cloven hooves. Good nose, Ron. Oh, shit! Detective Chung takes out Jansen, Matthias, and Burke. Pops makes a door in time for O'Brien to take a bullet and then get out of there. As the deceased Detective Chung morphs into Murderbot 3000. He finds Sarah and she explains the situation. They run into the Reese family and Sarah leads them out of the building, stopping Kyle and giving him a special message. Straight line. You just go and you don't look back. The team rendezvous in the evidence room. Nice to see you. Grab their gear and head to the roof for a helicopter ride. John locates them and opens fire as the helicopter falls over the edge. I don't think that's how helicopters work. They head towards Apple Campus with John on their tail. He takes out a tanker on the street, but I'm not gonna count the driver because the cab of the truck is still intact after the explosion. Just some broken bones and bruises. Just take some Advil and sleep it off. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. I'll be back. What? Pops excuses himself to go full Superman on John's chopper, causing it to crash smack dab into Cyberdyne campus. But at least they hit the landing pad. Security calls in the crash, and John gives Doug a run through of how to cancel the alarm. False alarm. You have a nice night. Sarah and Kyle arrive to find two more dead bodies on the sidewalk as they enter the building. Genesis reveals itself to them and is getting bigger by the minute. You want to destroy me? John then appears and takes a barrage of bullets while defending his little buddy. There are enough bullets in the world to kill me. Well, what about this? Will this shut your ass up for a couple of minutes? John Connor talks too much. While Pops was taken the long way to 2017, he also took a construction job building Cyber 9 campus. Until it was laid off. And he's infiltrated the systems and found the Death Star's weak spot. Kyle discovers they have a time machine, but it's not fully functional yet and they have liquid metal, but it's harmless without a CPU. They set charges to blow the building as Skynet goes through puberty. He's now at that age where he just won't shut up. What are you gonna do, talk us to death? And blathers on and on about how they can't win until John appears and gives his mom a big hug as she throws the detonator down to Pops. I cannot kill Sarah Connor. You have to! I order you! Then Kyle shows up and Sarah signals to him to do what needs to be done. Pops reaches out to hand Kyle the detonator, but terror rains down on Pops, and the two machines tear through the structure into the time displacement terror dome. Pops gets a few good jabs at John 2.0 while wearing his magnetic mittens. And John's like, damn, you must work out because your arms are shredded. Skynet locks Kyle and Sarah out and tells them to accept their fate. In exactly four minutes, I will be everywhere. Pops keeps up the good fight with 2.0 smacking him with lasers. The death bot then commences to beat the ever loving shit out of Pops with some powerful punches and begins to phase through the senior cyborg, every time weakening him more. John then chops his arm off and tells him, You are nothing but a relic from a deleted timeline. Kyle and Sarah finish their argument with Skynet and blast their way into the chamber. Why can't you just accept it? Because we're human. It's not looking too good for Pops when John declares the cyborg was never strong enough to defeat him. Not alone. John. Mom and Dad come to the rescue and team up to punish little Johnny while Pops recuperates. Pops drives his arm through the nanobot and body slams him into the time displacement machine. He tells Kyle to activate the field generator. Protect my Sierra. Kyle and Sarah make their way to an underground bunker as the magnetic field generator starts disintegrating the machines. Pops holds on to John until he's thrown from the machine and takes a dip in the liquid metal lazy river. While John Connor 2.0 is deleted from this timeline, taking the Cyberdyne campus and iOS Genesis with him. I hope they backed up to an external hard drive, or at least iCloud. In the bunker, Kyle comforts Sarah, telling her she can finally choose the life she wants. You're free. That's if they can get out of here before they run out of air, when suddenly they hear a tapping. As if someone's gently rapping at their chamber door. It's Pops! He's not dead! I thought you were dead. No. Just upgraded. But John was sent to the recycle bin. They take a little road trip so Kyle can have a conversation with himself and tell him about the future. 
while Pops and Sarah talk shit behind his back. Kyle Reese is a good man. He is. As they leave, Sarah says, wow, I finally have the right to choose. What a concept, the right to choose. Consider yourself lucky, Sarah, because the women in my timeline aren't afforded that luxury. So she chooses to lay a big wet one on Kyle, but it looks like Pops has mixed feelings about all this. Just joshing ya. That's really disturbing, right? It was over. They drive into the countryside and the movie ends with- oh, No, no, no! To my surprise, there is a mid credit scene in this movie. We scan through the campus to find out Skynet had a contingency plan in place. And I can't wait to see the dumpster fire that- Hang on. City Morgue, you stab him, we slab him. Oh, it was canceled. Okay, thanks. Turns out the sequel was canceled. Forget I said anything. But how many people were canceled in Terminator Genesis? Let's get out the blackboard and break it down. We've got a total of 58 bodies that we collected in Terminator Genesis. I could only positively identify eight of the victims, which left us with 50 John slash Jane Doe's. But there were no dogs that died, so nobody's going in the pet cemetery. Always good news. And with a runtime of 126 minutes, that left us sending out the meat wagon every 2.17 minutes. And the toe tag for best cause of death will go to John Connor. Even though the trailer spoiled this reveal, it's the most unique death in the movie. And it's a character we've been protecting for four films now. It's a ballsy move even for a lackluster movie like Genesis. And that wraps up my exam of Terminator Genesis. If you couldn't tell, this is by far my least favorite entry in the series. Obviously, they set up a lot here that they plan to answer with future sequels, but those sequels never came. I guess somebody wiped them from existence. For a group that claimed to be huge fans of the original film, they got so much wrong with this entry. I think the film is severely miscast in all aspects. Amelia Clark does the best she can with what she's got, but the performance still comes off as cringy. Oh, you both just really need to stop it. Jason Clark as John Connor seems very out of place, and Jai Courtney transforms the character of Kyle into a modern beefcake with no personality or charisma. In 2019, Terminator Dark Fate would pull the legacy sequel card following the success of Halloween the previous year and disregard every film post-Terminator 2. You've gotta be shitting me. No, I am not shitting you. Deadpool director Tim Miller takes the helm and James Cameron returns to the series as producer and writer. Arnold, of course, will be back along with Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor. With a new timeline and a new legion of machines, a new hero will be sent back to protect humanity's new hope for the resistance. Hey, you come with me or you're dead in the next 30 seconds. From an advanced new Terminator with a split personality. But will it be more compelling than Terminator Genesis? I'll be back to finish out the Terminator series with Terminator Dark Fate next time. Until then, I've been Josh, your movie examiner. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing. And hit the notification bell so you can join me next time I fill out toe tags for Cinema's Body Bags. Enjoy being alive!